Now, we were talking about just before about um, the vernacular, the, the, the words used to um, see this, or even the body language noticed. How do we unpack that? Like, what, are, what are the things, the tips, or, or even the terminology we need to understand in our head when we're noticing this thing? Well, I think, Adriel, in this context, we can look about the language of control and responsibility. So if my language and my external control psychology, for example, is uh, external sing signals have motivated my behaviour, then the language I will use is he or she made me do or think that. Mm. Keywords made me. Another simple example is I, if I truly believe I can control others' actions and feelings, then I will be talking about things like it scared me or surprised me. So that action of that person did that to me. So that, you, know, that, you, know, you hear it, you know, it's almost schoolyard stuff. That person looked at me the wrong way in that meeting. And therefore I, and I would not have done that because this happened and therefore the day was bad. But you're mm -hmm. saying that there's a different way to actually park that. Absolutely. And, and at least clarify, and if not, just put into perspective. That's right, and work out, well, do I actually have any influence over this or not? What can I control, what can't I? If it comes down to, and it will, the only thing I can control is myself and my own behaviour, then what is the point? So there's really something toxic about the word should and had. Isn't it? Very, mm, very, oh, and made. You made. made me. How? So what, what other terms would people, you know, the pub test, what, what other made you statements do you hear mm. and what, what could we what could think we do? otherwise? Yep. So we can look <clears throat> about the internal psychology and the choice uh, process where we would say, my wants and needs motivate my behaviour. So all behaviour self-enhancing, um, I will do something because I want something. The key is, how do I do what I do? Uh, and then, so I would be saying, if that is the case, the language I would be more likely to hear is that I felt, I thought, or I did, whatever. So I statements. I thought X, Y, Z happened. I feel sad, whatever, disappointed. Um, and I did. I actually went out and did ABC. That's what happened. So I'm owning it. Hmm. And when I know that um, I can only control myself um, and it's about what I think and do, I can control that, then I probably would be saying things like, I got scared or I was surprised. So it's about me saying, I know full well this is what's happened and this is my responsibility to acknowledge what it's done to me. You know, what, well, it's not what it's done to me, but how it's impacted on me. I own it. So it's putting it over there yes. and responding to it rather than wearing it, wearing it like a chip on the shoulder. Oh, absolutely, and blaming someone else for it. And another one is really understanding every person has their own way of living their life mm. as they should. So for me then, I would choose to say, oh, I saw that happen or I understand why that happened. But otherwise, see, if you're saying what you're saying, I, I could... Someone could potentially be revving their engine on their chip shoulder for most of their life. Yes. And attracting more of the same because mm. they interpret everyone else's reactions based on that mm. way of looking at everything and anyone. Absolutely. And You're out to get me. Yeah, exactly. And how helpful is that? Yeah. I, I remember when I first got involved in thinking about how I could shift the way I think about things, how I could shift my mental model. And I learned very quickly as I was working through the studies that, oh, I actually think it's other people's job to ensure that I'm happy. And I was thinking, I'm not really sure how they would do that. I need to be in control of my happiness. If I can't uh, ensure that I'm happy, how can anybody else? So I need to think about the choices I make. If I'm relying on and putting the pressure on someone else to do it for me or to me, then I am wasting my time and it's likely not to happen. But when I start to say, what makes me happy? What can I do that will give me that sense of purpose and well-being, not at the expense of any other person? That's key. Then I started to see a different way of thinking about life. I like how the slide ends that you'll see on the screen. 
I did it. I, I actually achieved this. So That's it's not, right. That has nothing to do with ego. It's very much about a sense of accomplishment, like making your bed. <laughs> and I've achieved it. And it's responsibility. I'm acknowledging I'm responsible for what I do. Yeah. And it, it's so it's so powerful. And I found in my life, and, and certainly in in working with others and running an organisation, the stress levels were significantly reduced. So if we go back to that small analogy about making your bed, I'm not making my bed in relation to what others think of what my room looks like. I'm making my bed because I'm owning the success and achievement of taking it off. That's right. I wanted to ensure that every day when I got up, the first thing I did, I could achieve. It was had, I didn't care whether people liked the fact that I make my bed or how I made it. It was immaterial to me. It was I've got up, I've done something, started, finished, ready for the day. So you're shifting your mental model anyway because you're yeah. saying... I've already achieved X, Y, Z before morning tea. Absolutely. Yeah. What else more can I achieve? That's right. So I, and I also accept as the day unfolds, uh, as we plan life happens, and often I will have a plan for the day, and it may not turn out that I get that plan to happen, but that's okay because I'm in control, I'm understanding what's happening, and I'm doing the best I can at the time with what I've got. Which People is who critical. say that they're in control often are running on, on a fear plane. But if you're actually in control like you're suggesting, there's certainly some skills there and tips there to actually make mm. it happen. Sort of like a sense of peace, really. Like well, I found that. I found yeah. that. I found it was less stressful for me because it immediately took the pressure off my expectation that someone else was going to do it so I'd be happy. Um, and I also learnt that people do things differently and that's okay. People don't have to do the same things the same way I do. Um, and it was just freeing and less stress. And what I was seeing in the workplace was people feeling safe to voice their views, people working hard because they felt and they were in an environment where they uh, were asked to take control of their own behaviour and accept that that is uh, their responsibility and it's all they can control. And people were just getting on with the job and it was a very pleasant, happy and safe place to work. So that's all the wires intersect. Everyone's jigsaw piece puzzle fits in then. Yep, absolutely. So no one's in, in relation or overtaking anyone else's. No, and if things weren't going as they should, because life's you know not a straight line, um, we had the skills to have a conversation that was not threatening. We had the skills to be able to do that, to give people an opportunity to have their voice heard and also to maintain their dignity and the key was people must be treated with dignity and respect at all times. And it's okay not to agree with everyone. Everyone has the right to an opinion. So by having that shifted or flexible mental model, uh, particularly from where it has been now until your, your new level, new plane, it's really, once that's settled, it's really about discovering your basic needs or needs um, rather than once, or particularly anyone else's needs, not your own. And that's what you'll hear with the next webcast in the series, Discovering Your Basic Needs. How do we discover that? And we'll be meeting and talking with Kathy Tool again about what do you do with that new platform now you've shifted? Talk to you soon.